Hello and welcome to the podcast, The Way of the Sensitive. I'm your host, Cara Weld. This is a podcast for those of us who feel called to live in a different way, to create a new society where diversity and uniqueness is celebrated, not shamed. We're the channels of the light, co-creating a heaven on earth upon this beautiful planet. We're here to live and achieve our soul's goals in this lifetime. To us, it's not woo, it's real. Call in all the magic makers, the mystics, the empaths, the sensitives, the starseeds, the artistic, autistic ones, sometimes sidelined, sometimes scapegoated, but we know that we're here to create new pathways in the one mind, because it's not just about traversing alternative dimensions, it's also about landing and being fully alive in this gorgeous world. there misfits welcome to the show show number four and today I'm interviewing Laura Hackle who is an occupational therapist teaching parents how the tools and skills you already have available can be applied to help your child through challenges and I first came across Laura when she was um making a pitch on a business course I belong to about a program that she's wanting that she is now running um, she was just launching it at the time um, the whole self in community a dedicated network for parents who want to go deeper than service level parenting tips and help each other do the work that's really making change in their children's lives so when she was when I first came across Laura she was pitching the whole self in community and getting feedback from us and I was listening to her describing the needs of her clients or you know parents like us um, who are dealing with sensitive children and children that are probably diagnosed with having special needs in our society and I just kind of burst into tears because she really really got it and the fact that you know a, a professional really got it at that time made a big impact on me so we talk about her work but more than that it's not just about whether you know this podcast is obviously for you if you've got children with sensory sensitivities but it's also for those of us that are sensitive or empaths or find that we get overwhelmed um and we talk particularly about the science because that's always helpful I think if you know the reasons from a biological and a scientific point of view of why you're experiencing the crashes and the highs that you're experiencing it's really good to know and to have that education. We also talk about you know how to recognize if you are hyper aroused um, and what to do about it I know many channels that I talk to are just like there's this really high vibe that comes and I can't hold it um, and Laura talks about that from her perspective and we kind of come at come at this conversation from opposite ends of the um, a kind of spectrum of different clients that we work with but meet in the middle where different interventions overlap so listen in and pay particular attention to the five strategies that she talks about that you can use daily I to help soothe sensitivities and move from one state to another um, and I tried this with my children straight after the podcast and was really impressed at how effective it was so as always let me know what you think in the free Facebook group at carawild.com forward slash Facebook group and let's keep the conversation going enjoy the show Hello everybody and welcome to show four and today we have Laura Hackle with us. Hi Laura. Hi Kara. It's good to be with you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I just wanted to share for everybody that was listening that um, Laura, you're an occupational therapist, right? Yes. And I first met Laura when in a business group that we belong to and Laura was talking about a exciting new program that she is working on and she can tell you more about that at the end. And it was specifically for parents with children with special needs and it made me 
cry because I have never felt so heard as a parent before. You know, obviously children with special needs is close to my heart. And when Laura talked, it was really clear that she understood our struggles, that she understood the journey, and that she probably understood what it was also like to be a sensitive in the world. And so I'm just like, oh, I need her on the show. I really need to hook up with this woman. Um, so I know we've had a bit of a pre-chat, Laura, so you do consider yourself a sensitive um, and, and needing to navigate the world in a kind of slightly different way. Is that right? Uh, yes, I would say that. Yes. And, and what's that? What do you like about being a sensitive? Actually, I ask everybody that what's really good about it. Um, well, well, now that I've had 38 years behind me at this, <laughs> um, you know, I, I like that I see, I see deeply into things. I see deeply into people and I see deeply in objects and situations. Um, but that requires for me that I take more time with stuff. So as a, as a much younger person, I felt that I couldn't keep up, I think, with people. I, I wasn't as quick to figure out what people were thinking or who was who was flirting with who or <laughs> all these social things that are so important when you're a teenager and young adult. And um, uh, now I, I've found my groove. I know what I'm, what I'm good at and I know when I need time to take a break. So what helped you find that groove? Well, I am an occupational therapist. And so um, I, I tend to think now that I've, I've always been this way. I've always studied what effects different things have on me. So um, when I was young, I was very into gymnastics. Four days a week, I was in the gym, flipping and rolling and tumbling. Wow. And I, I've always, you know, after that, I got into surfing. And uh, later on, I've gotten into martial arts. And it, it seems to me that when I'm immersed in an activity, especially a very physical activity, it changes me. And who I am. Um, oh, it that's the way fascinating. I feel. The way yeah. I to the world. <laughs> yeah. So and and so um, obviously, I wanted to get you on the podcast because it's not we were not necessarily not all of our listeners have got kids with special needs, although a lot of us have because we're you know we're sensitives ourselves. But also, you know, your work obviously listening to you as well it's helped you navigate how to take care of your own sensitivities and for me you've just hit something that was just a huge aha moment for me and that's like the having a really strong connection with your physical body but physical activities seem to be really important and I'd that came as a bit of a shock to me so it was my guide that told me to start running this is my story and people i'm sorry i know i can be boring you've told me i've told it loads of times but i was smoking at the time and mm -hmm. so when i heard my guide tell me to start running i was just like well I choked on my cigarette smoke and just i'd never been athletic at all but I decided to give it a go and it's one of the most empowering things that I've done. And then I started lifting heavy weights and I found that almost like reassured my nervous system. So this aspect of the conversation about real physical activities for sensitives is really fascinating for me. And I know some people who are nowhere in our audience kind of don't see the connection. And I just wondered if you would like mm -hmm. talk a bit more about that. Oh, sure. You've hit on a topic I'm really passionate Yay. about. So you, you have to put up your hand and say stop <laughs> when, it's, when it's time. Go for it. Um, so this is a passion of mine because um, what I've studied of the nervous system and everything I've experienced in my life is, has pointed me toward how important the activity of the body is for everything that comes from the brain. Uh, your mindset, your emotions, your um, alertness you know, that, that feeling where you're scattered or where you're focused is, is controlled very much by the state of your body. Um, there, there's a quote, it doesn't come from me, but I really want to use it here. And uh, I heard it from a, a man known as uh, Charlie Gilkey. He says, your body is not a head transportation device. <laughs> and we have to be reminded of this because sure. we, we have these big brains and um, this is maybe especially true for sensitives. We're, we're thinkers. We, we think deeply about things and it's easy to get stuck up here. So um, 
for not just our physical health, but our mental and emotional health. Uh, being regularly physically active, it, it does change the brain and it changes the body. So, well, I mean, I know you, you can't necessarily go into too much technical detail or well, it'll turn into a lecture for us, which I'm very, very happy to experience, by the way, but maybe that's not right for the listeners, um, is can you, what happens? How, how does that physical, you know, physical exercise, physical movement, how does that affect the brain? Well, um, I don't want, we could get way too technical, but yeah. if you're interested in talking at all about uh, neurotransmitters, there, there's, there's really a big three that I pay attention to. Okay. And, and as an occupational therapist, I don't have to actually work on a brain. I'm working with a person. So it's, it's fine to look at this globally. Mm -hmm. um, but the three important chemicals of the brain that we want to talk about are first adrenaline. We all know how adrenaline feels. Mm -hmm. It's it's your fight or flight. Um, it's there when you're excited as well. Uh, but it, it generally, you can only take so much of that. You can take a rush or a thrill. You need to calm down after that. And if adrenaline builds up and builds up, there are problems. The next one that's important to know about is dopamine. Most people have heard of these, even if they don't know a lot about what they are. Yeah. Especially if anyone's ever been prescribed any medication. It's generally acting on either dopamine or the one I was, I was going to describe next, serotonin. Dopamine is often described of as the chemical of love. It is the one that you feel when, when you feel best, when someone gives you a hug um, right after physical exercise, when you're using your muscles, um, and definitely when you're experiencing touch, you know, if you're all wrapped up in a warm blanket with your hot tea or hot cocoa. Mm. And dopamine has a very important role of down-regulating adrenaline. It, it can sort of let that clear out okay. in a way that just trying to wait it out might not do. Yeah. And uh, the third one that is important when we're talking about uh, using the body to affect your, your nervous system is serotonin. Serotonin is another one that people need to affect through medication sometimes. But serotonin is also received when you do a kind act for someone, when you witness a kind act from someone, um, and when you're engaged in some kind of activity that you really enjoy, mm, okay. something that lights you up. Yeah, yeah. So the simple, not simple explanation, I think, would be to talk about regulating that chemistry. Maybe one more thing that is important to mention is that your brain is alive. Um, we're, we're talking about millions, if not billions, of living cells that are forming connections with one another. Each time I meet Kara and she says something nice to me and I get that little rush of dopamine, a few more nerve connections grow. I start to feel good just by thinking about you. Mm. And the same is true for all of your experiences. So, so the whole kind of regulating the nervous system, um, I know it's a really, like what you're sharing is a really simple model, but keeping those three things in balance is, is really key for what I call when I'm working with clients is like st stabilizing the channel. You know, so we bring down this high kind of information, but we need to make sure that we're stable with that so that we can hold what we call in our terminology frequencies, which tend to excite us because they're like this high vibe, you know, and it's like, it's better than a sugar rush, but it's that kind of, ah, and those blissful states, and then we come back into physical reality, we're so excited, we're so excited, and then just, we need to ground and we need to stabilize it. It could be a shock coming back to physical reality, right? There can be two things. So my experience as a channel is when I've gone and done what I call high teaching, so I bring down like high information about reality, physical reality, and what the intention is. And I mean, this is like, this is, um, channels jargon so you'll have to tell me if none of this is making sense but um, so we get what we call downloads so they're those big aha moments but they come in a kind of really kinesthetic way so it's like you get feelings and information and it's really all at the same time and it's a really um, yeah in those places it's just a really blissful state and so when you come back it can be like oh this feels really quite dull and it can be quite 
it can be quite a shock sometimes but then so there's that aspect of it and then also you just everything gets so excitable and we can get so excitable and so yes 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 and i'm gonna do this gonna do that and then we can't hold that and then we crash and i know that puzzles a lot of people i don't know if that's kind of making any sense to you from your background oh yes it's interesting as i as i hear these words that are different to me i, I plug them in they fit very nicely with <laughs> the neurology that I, I do like to study and, and understand the world by. Okay. Um, so yet yeah, a balance of the three things are very important. And I love that you mentioned frequency because that's an area that's being studied about the brain is the synchronicity, how different parts of the brain, um, you know, they, they have, for lack of a better word, a heartbeat, you know, a frequency that the neurons are firing. Okay. And if, if different parts of the brain are firing at different times without coordination, that that is probably like the feeling you're describing. And when therapists work on sensory integration, we're, we're working on getting the brain to work in sync. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, only occasionally do researchers actually scan the brain so that they know what parts are firing at what times. But you can observe it in a person. You can observe when they're calm and focused at the same time or when they're you know, too excited to focus and too scattered or when they're low because they've crashed. Yeah. You can observe it in yourself. So, okay, um, so the, go on, sorry, were you going to say something or more? Well, when you speak of the downloads, it, it, what, it what I think of, because you, you describe a rush of emotion and, and feelings, and, and I think I was understanding that it, it takes a while to process Yes, it all can. of that. Yes, so it's like getting a stream of information so you know instantly. So when I'm channeling for somebody, I know something instantly, but then I have to backpedal and unthread it to explain it. So yes, the processing right. like that, that happens. So it's like it comes in a pocket of information, but then it needs to unpack, yeah. Well, this means something to me in the world of sensory integration as well, because something I'm very passionate about in terms of reminding our brains that they have bodies yeah is that when people talk about strategies how to help themselves or how to help their children they're, they're very often going from the top down or really from the outside in yes so your your cortex or or even more somebody standing next to you tells you something uses some words to uh, kind of cue you to think a certain way and then that's supposed to filter down into the inside of the brain Mm -hmm. But that's not really how the brain works. The brain works much more the way you just described, where any piece of information you're getting, whether it's from your eyes or ears or skin or body, it comes first into your brain stem, into that part that's responsible for survival. Then it goes to the midbrain where you feel it and yeah. understand it intuitively. And only later, we're talking about fractions of a second usually, but it still it takes a while. This is a big download of information. Only later is it processed by the cortex where you can start to put into words what this is, what that oh, happened. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's why when I want to help people and um, occupational therapists do work this way, we, we say work from the bottom up. Work through the body, work through the feelings, then work on the ideas. That's fascinating because I'm just doing um, some training at the moment in, I don't know if you're aware of Peter Levine's work. Um, a little bit. Yeah, so so for people listening, Peter Levine did, um, he's the founder of what's called sensory experiencing, um, somatic experiencing, which is helping people overcome traumas. And I'm learning about the nervous system, primarily because I think sensitives are more easily traumatized. Um, and what I'm learning is that a trauma is not the event, it's what happens after the event and how we manage that um, and one of the things that I'm just coming across in there and specifically how it relates to autism because there is a theory that autism is on the trauma pathway that's mm. kind of what it is and I, I'm not sure about that and the whole nature nurture debate is like a really fascinating one to me at the moment but what's really coming to me is as you're saying it is the processing is done from the bottom up so it's the link between the gut the heart and the brain and we tend to think mm -hmm. that the brain is in charge but what um 
but what we're kind of noticing is like the gut is almost its own brain the heart is almost its own brain so a friend of mine was talking to me about this yesterday and explaining it a bit more for me um and then it kind of it's almost like we need to have a sense of security that comes from a gut so that we can listen to it and that's where i feel like instinctive intuition lives from process it through the heart so we're not living in fear and then we kind of get the the higher brain thinking which is the planning and the executive functioning and the looking at like the future events so it's like it's whoever i'm talking to at the moment it's kind of all come in and everybody's kind of saying the same thing Mm -hmm. that's yes that's that's fascinating and i've read a lot about the gut and brain connection and i like where you bring the heart in i don't know much about eastern medicine but that sounds very in line with it yeah um, um i'm certain there is a gut and brain connection all of my experience with myself and with others has told me that mm -hmm. um unfortunately as a therapist we're our research doesn't know what to tell people about that. Okay. Yeah. Should, should I feed my child this? Should I not feed my child that? I, mm. You know, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a connection. Mm -hmm. See what happens when you try. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in terms of like helping that process, so, so when we get information, it comes in through the brain stem and then mm -hmm. it filters up into the emotional brain and then into the, the higher functioning brain, which, um, as my understanding of it, that's the stuff that I think a lot of channels struggle with, which is the planning, the making things concrete and physical and and what we call living in physicality, living in physical reality. So the stuff that gets stuff done, <laughs> you know, the pits of things that get stuff done. And I don't know this for sure, but my sense is that we, ca like our brain stems might just be like quite active. I agree completely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have heard the the midbrain, you know, that area on top of the brainstem where you're where it's all emotion and you're not really making decisions. Yeah. Uh, but you certainly are aware of feelings as kind of a gatekeeper. Okay. Um, this is this is a helpful concept when you're trying to help people through activities. If there is a natural point at which that gate slap shit slams shut or cracks <laughs> because it's too much coming in and you haven't been able to process everything that's coming up from below to begin with. Mm. Um, and this is the explanation for why we don't necessarily try to teach something new or have a high expectation of, I work with children, so what a child can do um, when I know he's in a heightened emotional state, when he's over um, overstimulated. Yeah, okay. And so if I want, if that child needed to learn something about the situation he was in, the very first focus needs to be on calming. Mm -hmm. he, he needs to sort of relax that gatekeeper and start having a flow of information up and down the brainstem because it, it, it feeds back as well. That's how your brain starts to control your body. Okay. Um, before things can process. So what you're saying that there's so much excitement going on at the at the lower levels, at the emotional brain levels, that makes it very hard to get information in and out of the cortex. The cortex needs things to kind of be in order. The cortex being the, the outer portions of your brain, the part that gets stuff done. Okay, yeah. And so, so there's like information that comes down from these other realms, but I know a lot of people are listening as well also get, and you'll see this in your own life and, and with, with the kids that you work with, I'm sure, and I see it in my own. We get a lot of information just from the world because mm. we are sensitive and we pick up undertones, we pick up things that are not said, we pick up things... You know, and noises are louder and everything's brighter and sharper. And that's one of the beautiful things about being a sensitive is you just notice things really deeply. Um, but you feel things really deeply. So although your work is with, with children, I think, you know, if you could share some of those strategies that help us to soothe that, almost that fight-flight reaction. So there's a few few questions I've got. First of all is how do we recognize when we're in hyper arousal? Like what are the signs? Okay, good one. Um, 
I look first at breathing and posture. So you can look at this in yourself. What, what are your shoulders doing? Are they up? Is your head jumped forward? Yeah. So what, what are your hands doing? Moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. are, are they clenched or, or splayed out? This I see a lot with kids. You know, they're doing some activity, but their hands are wide like that. Yeah. Um, if you can see yourself or if you're trying to assess another person, how are your eyes? Are they very wide? Um, all of those things can happen when you're excited, but th there's only a fine line between excitement and distress. You can maintain an excited state for only too long. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would look at posture, look at breathing, look at how you're holding your hands and your eyes. Um, look at the pacing of things. This is one for myself. Um, I need to notice if I'm interrupting someone, <laughs> for example. Um, and if I find myself doing that, if I find it's actually difficult to wait till a person is done speaking, then that's kind of an internal data point to myself. Okay, overexcited, take a breath, sit back. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. So, and, and that can happen as well, can't it? When we can't, co we can't cope with the feelings that are being generated. So, yeah. so I suppose for grown-ups, there's the addition of like, um, you know, we can kind of numb ourselves and want to separate ourselves from our emotions. Um, and so keeping in that hyper aroused state is a way of doing that, really. You know, I call it just like flying out your body. So that is a way of, of, of numbing almost. Yeah. And it is hard to change your state. Um, you know, if you're feeling in a hyper aroused state, you don't necessarily, it's hard to change. Mm -hmm. The kind of things you might need to do to calm down are at such a different frequency from where you are right there that it's kind of hard to get in that groove. So I just want uh, to clarify a few a few more things as well about how to recognize you in that hyper aroused state. So is that mm -hmm. when we tend to forget things and, you know, we're unfocused and we forget we've lost something or left something on or we forget appointments or is that linked to that state? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, in, in kids, the people I work with most, I notice that they will flip from thing to thing, you know, and, and people will say, well, that you need, he needs to work on his attention or, yeah. <laughs> or worse. Um, you know, he just needs to focus, <laughs> but it's, they, even a, an activity they might particularly like, they just aren't quite able to settle They grab one thing and say, Oh, I want to go do that. Oh, I want to go do that. Um, and I, I've seen that dynamic in myself. I think adults, at least externally, will have it together a bit more as far as our managing our day to day activities. But we know what it feels like when it's difficult, yeah. when we're avoiding the thing that we that we know that we need to get done or we keep jumping from one activity to another and never really getting anything done. Yeah. So that's really useful to, to, to stay out of self criticism, isn't it? Instead of criticizing, like you were saying, sometimes children are criticized. They can be labeled as naughty or defiant, or they just don't want to pay attention. Mm -hmm. They're lazy, you know, all of those things that can happen through, school and teachers in particular who might just not have the awareness of what's actually going on and we can translate that into ourselves into adults and, and go into self-criticism of like oh i'm useless i can't get projects done i can't you know oh why did i do that i'm such an idiot and and so it can be like a really more compassionate response is you know okay so maybe i am just in a hyper aroused state, what do I need to do? How can I support myself? So for, you know, for people listening, it, it, it can be a really good mindset shift to, to bring in and introduce a more self-compassionate reaction. Does that make sense? I agree, yes. Yeah. And training yourself to observe your body, it, I think it helps a little bit with that detachment from judging. Like, uh, like they teach in, med uh, excuse me, they teach in meditation. Yeah. Um, you know, if you observe that you've got distracted or tense or forgot your breathing or something, it's not the time to kick yourself. It's, it's a data point. Oh, look at that. I was thinking about work. Yeah. <laughs> Let me bring my focus back on the president. Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing happens as a teacher and as a parent. Um, it's frustrating if you ask a child to go do something and they go do something entirely different, you know, <laughs> somewhere in your mind, you might go, oh, you little, but yeah. 
I have to remind myself, and I've had enough experience working with with groups of kids, that when they're unfocused, I had a role in that. If I come to work unfocused, mm. the kids in front of me will be unfocused. Yeah. And so I can um, channel, I'm not sure if the word means the same for me as for you, yeah. but I can channel how I'm feeling and it affects how they're feeling. If I see that child rolling on the floor and I think, oh, I can't believe you just did that, their response to me is very different from when I'm compassionate and I say, oh, you've had a long day at school today. Let me come on over and <laughs> approach. Oh, that's gorgeous, yeah. And that's really kind of you know useful to be reminded of as a parent as well, because sometimes you can feel really powerless and, and you know, not sure what to do and how to handle it and, and whether you do behavioral, but we kind of know that that's like the last point really. Um, but it's a, it's a really good reminder that that relational field you know, it's almost like our nervous systems talk to each other. It, yes, without, they do. Yeah, without us knowing it. And so it, what's just coming to me now, and I don't know if this, this is right or not, but it's almost like our point of power is our regulating ourselves. We're going to have more impact if we learn how to self-regulate and self-care and, and be compassionate to ourselves. We can offer more of that field to our children. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. And also, I'll slide in there that is still a time for self compassion. Yeah. Because we yeah. will mess it up <laughs> again yeah. and again. Yeah. There will be times when we realize that our kid is acting out and it was because we were un impatient. Yeah. And there's, there's no time to go backwards in time and, and realize that you should have got more sleep last night. It's time to go forward, <laughs> recognize it, and yeah and breathe and that can be so hard when you want to do a good job as a parent and when you're asking these kind of questions you know for anybody listening in who might be giving themselves a hard time the fact that you're asking these questions and you want to know this information and you're looking at it from a more holistic point of view that deserves a pat on the back you know because it's not it's not out there in it's not like we're surrounded by it every day of in terms of support and accessing this way of thinking you know it's the, the strategies that are out there are not this, which is why I love the work that you're doing. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of the people listening and taking care of their own kind of nervous systems or the hyper arousal. So we've got some sense of how to recognize that. I wanted to I do another story as well. This morning I was dropping things all over the place and I was getting the kids breakfast ready and I kept dropping everything. And years ago, I would have been, oh, what, you idiot, just what you're doing, get it together, you know, really, really hard on myself. But I remember reading this story of this woman who said, you know, she started saying, oh, are you OK today? Well, you seem to be drop dropping things. Are you all right? You know, what's going on? What do you need? And that was her internal speak, which was just like a foreign language to me at the time. I wouldn't have addressed myself like that. But so this morning I was like, OK what's happening, do you need to slow down, are you okay? And that was my kind of internal self-talk which helped me realize I was, I'd got a busy work day and I've got the kids here and you know, so it was like that allowed more compassion in. So we know the kind of like self-talk can be quite regulating and, and soothing, but are there any, any other strategies that you would suggest for bringing us out of hyper arousal in a way that's not too much of a shock. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, okay. I have that. Now I go immediately to two, my brain goes immediately in two different directions. Okay. Cool. What I'd like to give you today are, um, five sensory strategies that, I will call them sensory strategies. So really, I call them sensory survival strategies because it isn't what I was taught in school to work on the nervous system. Yeah. The, the second direction I want to go is to tell you what I was taught in school to work on the nervous system. That stuff works really well as well. Cool. Um, the only problem with it is sometimes it's too much of a shock. You're not ready to go there yet. Right. Okay. Now so. I'm fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So uh, the the five things, by the way, I wrote up in the form of an article, and I do have a link I would like to share so that anybody could download them. Brilliant. I'll put those in the show notes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, the very first one is drink water. And the reason why that is top of the list is because there is almost no time or place when you can't drink water. And in fact, if if you feel like you can't, that's probably a sign that you're all you're very hyper aroused right now. You're anxious or stressed and wow. you aren't taking a break to give yourself a drink of water. Okay. Um, this works for kids no matter how young, assuming they're old enough to drink water and even a baby, I suppose you could give them a bottle. But what I do is um, just go fill a cup for myself, go fill a cup for the child. I'm often working with the child and their parents, so I ask them to do it as well. And we all sit down and we take a drink. We don't say to the, the again, I'm working with little kids a lot of the time. We don't say that a two-year-old, hey, honey, do you want a drink? Because honey is a little bit upset or over aroused right now. They're going to say no or they're it's just not going to work that way. So we sit down, we take a drink. And the reason why this works is you probably needed water anyway. Mm. And when you drink, you, you bring your focus back to the center of your body. Okay. You slow your breathing. And just by doing that, you've kind of put a break in the activity. Um, so that can be used anytime, and I highly encourage people to use it anytime because they'll forget. They're thinking of big ideas. How do I get him to do this? How do I get him to put his shoes on, get ready for school, whatever? Yeah. Down, take a little drink, and uh, you might be more ready for that next step. Yeah. The next one on my list is breathe. Breathe deeply. And the only problem with that is it's very difficult to tell yourself to breathe. Um, it's challenging as an adult. And we actually obey that higher, the higher parts of our brain much better than children do because ours are more developed. So I can tell myself, you know, I'm, I need to breathe deep and I might just do it. Every time I've ever told a child to breathe deep, they've just started gasping. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. instead, choose an activity that will cause you to take a deep breath. Okay. Um, might be blowing bubbles, might be pouring a hot tea and blowing on it. One that I love because it's very easy to do with a young kid is um, put a blanket over yourself and say, we're hiding. Shh. Uh, okay. So you get the idea. Think yeah. of the feeling of a breath and find the activity that will make you take it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the third one is wiggle your toes. Hmm. Um, that is because you can do it anywhere. Mm. You can be wearing shoes. You can be at a meeting and you can just tell yourself, I need to get in touch with my body. I'm going to wiggle my toes. Scrunch them up, spread them out, see if you can wiggle just one. It's a it's a quick and easy way to bring the elevator down uh, and get yourself out of your thoughts a little bit. And it physically gets you in touch with your body. Yeah. Um, fourth is, hmm, have I got it memorized? I'm remembering number five. Oh, fourth is stretch. <laughs> I should know this one. <laughs> So just stretch. Anyone can stretch anywhere. It's not very difficult to get a child to stretch. Um, the reasons why it works, I'll talk a little in a, in a bit when I talk about the more technical sensory approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the fifth one is sing and dance. Um, the reason singing and dancing is important to make my list of the five things you can do anytime and anywhere yeah. is because it brings everything together. Um, if you don't feel you're a great singer, you're not comfortable singing, then put on some music and move. But mm -hmm. it brings together um, synchronicity, different parts of the brain working in harmony together. You can set the pace. You can put on something fast if that's how you feel. You could follow it with something slow if you're trying to slow yourself down. Um, and if you are singing, which is kind of my go-to, you're also breathing. Mm. Uh, music produces an emotional connection whether you're doing it with someone or whether you're just enjoying your own tunes, you feel socially connected. It's something that people feel very deeply. Mm. So those are my top five go-tos. You can bring them out almost anywhere. So they're kind of, um, they're really simple, but they've got a lot of layers to each one. It's not mm -hmm. each one just doesn't do one, one specific task, but also they're quite, 
they're gentle even the dancing which is probably the most you know um activating but they are quite gentle you know the the, the simple and gentle and i can imagine them being like quite soothing i think the water one's fascinating but yeah okay so five brilliant thank you and uh, the the other way that you went you said well, I, I feel it should be at least mentioned if you really want to work on your nervous system, say you feel like you get into that state a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not just this morning you were dropping things, but it happens a lot and you really want to try to produce a change over time. I, I mentioned at the start of our conversation that I, what I'm sure has helped me has been always involved in a highly motivating physical activity. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that makes change over time. The first time I went to a martial arts session, I didn't come back feeling like I own my body, but <laughs> after 12 years, I, it, it's become a huge part of who I am. Um, so there's, there's three main areas that I would like people to focus on if they're really trying to pr produce a change in how they feel over time. It can work right away, but it's sometimes hard to just bring in one of these three if you haven't done drinking water, or taking a breath, or something to just make a quick shift. Um, so the first is touch, especially deep pressure touch, um, getting in and snuggling with somebody, um, wrapping something tightly around yourself if you're trying to get pressure touch on your own. Uh, I seem to be partial to the kind of physical activities that really thrash my body around, so I know I get touched that way as well, mm -hmm. being in the water or rolling on the mat. Those things work for me. Mm -hmm. um, it has to come first. Deep pressure has to come first, and that's because of the balance between adrenaline and dopamine and serotonin. Um, if you have a lot of, if you don't have a lot of adrenaline, maybe you could start with any one of these three. But if you have a lot of adrenaline in your system, it is best to start with touch. The other things might just rev you up more. Mm, okay, okay, that makes sense. The second very foundational sensory tool is um, muscle activity. So really using and exerting your muscles, exercise, running. Some of the things that I like to do uh, will will get more than one of these three sensory areas. Yeah. So I mentioned martial arts. Well, I'm getting touch and muscle activity at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the muscle activity begins to increase serotonin, and that's a very good thing. Sometimes, sometimes dopamine can be a bit addictive. Mm. So you're you're all curled up on the couch with your iPad and you're you, you've got plenty of dopamine going on <laughs> and it just feels really good and you just really don't want to stop. Yeah. Um and and parents of kids who are sensitive have probably found this as well. They will feel really really angry if that is interrupted after yeah. it's kind of gone oh, on too that long. That makes so much sense. <laughs> but like shifting from one task like that to doing something else if they're in a dopamine bath. Who wants yes. to get out of that? Nobody wants to stop that. Right. Mm. And so you feel angry. Yeah. Um, so the way to help shift that is with serotonin, um, which is a, a physical muscle activity. But um, I'm often in a position to try and do this intentionally. So you don't just go from the dopamine bath to, hey, it's time to practice martial arts now. But, you, <laughs> you know, someone might sit down next to you and and give you a squeeze or I mentioned wiggling your toes again I'm working with little kids so I might do um, this little piggy turn it into tickles turn it into rough and tumble and now we're using our muscles oh I am so oh. using that you might have just <laughs> saved my life at the moment Ooh. <laughs> that's no, I, I do. really interesting uh-huh Thank you. Um, I do work with older kids as well in the context of martial arts. So yeah. professionally, I'm working with young ones. And on the side, I'm, I'm teaching Aikido to the kids. Mm. Um, so, of course, I'm not going to play this little piggy, but I would still bring in muscle activity gently until they're on board with it, like do some stretching. So it's almost like you're waking up the system. By, yes. Yeah. So, so I know that... <clears throat> Some of the some of the learnings I've had is, you know, we don't want to live without stress. We need good stress. So the stress of, you know, the physical activity or finishing a project or, you know, some of the stuff that buzzwords that's out there is get shit done, you know, but yes. just that we need that good stress to be effective and to and to mm -hmm. feel alive. It's, it's when we get stuck there, like you say, with too much adrenaline, perhaps. And, and you know, we get stuck there. Um, or we get stuck 
on the kind of other end of like that dopamine bath and we just we don't we don't want to move and that's kind of like more like a crash almost Mm -hmm, I think so yeah so it's like we need a balance of of that good stress and I've that that kind of sense of those really practical strategies that I can think to myself as well of waking myself up over to the dopamine and using it in that way to think that I'm stepping up into like a a more alert presence and state when I want to do a different kind of activity. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. I think the body needs to spend some time in each state, yeah. but what can be hard is making the shift. So when yeah. you can be intentional about making the shift between one state and the next, then you won't find a mismatch between the frequency your body is running and the thing you're trying to do. Yeah. So, so as grown ups, we can, I know we, we do this thing in our house, we call it sensory squeeze. So like I've always known, even, <clears throat> even before I really, you know, I've, I've got a diagnosis of Asperger's on the autism pathway. So even mm-hmm. before I had that, I just knew I was kind of sensitive and had sensory processing. Um, I don't like the word disorder, but it was different for me. And so it was, it's always been somebody grab hold of me and squeeze me really tight and I've always said it feels like it resets my system my body just goes ah and and that's it but when I'm when I'm in that killed up state and it might be a Netflix fest and I need to get (laughs) moving I suppose I could just like just squeeze my arms you know if I'm on my own I could squeeze my arms I could wriggle my toes I could do the stretching and and that way I still have to get off the couch but that kind (laughs) of would help me kind of wake up and 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 do it do it that way do it in a gentler way rather than having to use the words of get up <laughs> right <laughs> right you have to bring down the discipline in your own mind yeah yeah I agree I think when you start to wiggle your toes and stretch it there can come a point where you actually feel like getting off the couch mm-hmm. then your brain is all aligned and you get off the couch yeah <laughs> yeah okay Wow, God, that's been so rich. I think I'm sure that people will find that really, really useful. And I'd love to hear from sensitives who, you know, are listening in, who recognize these states and have learned something or had any ahas about um, how they can support themselves moving from one state to another in a really, like, more compassionate and and gentle way, but also more effective long term. So so that's it. Uh, The last question I had... um, about this topic was you said you know so we're constantly wiring differently we're constantly moving and you were saying if you wanted to help you longer term these strategies um, are useful so I'm assuming that as we're using them I remember reading um, the out of sync child for this as we're as mm-hmm. we're using these strategies and as we're doing these on a daily basis we're building new pathways we're building more resilience and it will take time you know almost mm-hmm. like to give ourselves a new foundation or you know or just a new pattern yes i i believe really strongly in the brain's ability to rewire itself but it does take time yeah so um you know, if there's been some kind of insult, like a nerve injury or, or, you know, you banged your head, nothing serious, you're going to heal. It takes, you know, three weeks yeah. for there to be some kind of noticeable change. Yeah. So I, I know that's happening because the living neurons are growing. Yeah. And um, the same applies then. Interestingly, research says it takes 21 days to form a new habit. Yeah. So three weeks. The same applies if you're trying to um, train, retrain yourself to experience things a different way. It helps to focus on just one function, maybe breathing, and give yourself some regular cues. You're going to breathe when you wash dishes. You're going to breathe when your child has a meltdown. And practice that for a good three weeks before you start to notice it becomes automatic. Yeah. Okay, and the water one as well. I mean, that's just yeah, and using they it seem in that simple. way. Oh, yeah, they seem simple. You would think that you could just do it. Oh, drinking water—that makes so much sense. <laughs> but try using it, yeah. and you'll find it really does take practice. Ah, uh, oh, that'd be really good. We should start a um, twenty-one day challenge of sensory. Ooh. Yeah, maybe <laughs> like we should that, talk yeah. about that. That would be interesting to do to support people in in building 
more healthy sensory support systems i don't know what to call it but yeah that that would be a really good thing to do so um so what's your website where can people find you on the web um the website is wholeselfin.com so it's um whole w-h-o-l-e self s-e-l-f that's all one word yeah hyphen i-n dot com okay i'll put that in the show notes as well yeah and um, I'll, I'll send you the link because I, I made a, a page where someone can just go and download those five strategies. So mm. that is forward slash live sensitive. OK. And, so. and you're doing um, you're doing a launching a beta project soon, aren't you? This is where I first got to know about you. And I just think it's amazing what you are, are offering. Do you want to just tell people a bit about that? Oh, yes. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, my new project is the whole self in community. Um, and it's a private online community for parents who are ready to take action and need some support from people like you, people like me, the kind of people who will accept your child for who he is right now and push him to become something better. Yeah. We, we want this for ourselves. We want this for our kids. And what I would like to see is parents who are a wealth of ideas and insight about their kids, um, whom I learn from every day for the past 15 years to uh, be able to connect to each other and work on these strategies together in a supportive community. And, and I, what I loved about this in particular was the, the support that you can get just knowing that you're not on your own in this, that other parents are going through very, very similar things. And there's something on your website as well about it's okay having all this external advice, but you need to make it work and find ways that work in, like, in your own homes and it's got to come from the inside almost like the strategies you're there to support and give information but this is about you becoming in charge really of, of strategies that work for you that was my sense that's what I got really excited because there's not yes. that much support out there yeah and it's not so easy to get you know I'm, I'm part of the system right now as a therapist. I, I know how long people wait to get a diagnosis. Yeah. I know how they, we have to struggle to get insurance to cover this. And, and I also know that people are reaching out for support. They're joining Facebook groups. They're talking to each other. They yeah. feel so validated just hearing someone say, hey, me too. Mm, and so important. Who... I don't want to knock therapy. Therapy is important. It's good to get that one-on-one -on -one coaching in the room with the swings and things like that. Um, and yet there's people reaching out looking for help. And, and who are we to separate ourselves like that? It's, yeah. it's the Internet. I want to share that information with people. Yeah, yeah. Because parents are the ones that make a change. What you do every day becomes who you are. See, that parents are the ones who make a change. That's so empowering compared to some of the messages that we get. I love that. I love that. All right. So I think, are you launching that early May? The... Yes. Yeah. Um, on May 1st, what I'm hoping to do is run a pilot group. Um, I'm putting out videos twice a week that uh, where I'll go through the five sensory strategies, for example. Those things are free for anyone to come and, and explore. Yeah. But what I'd really like to do is have a, a smaller group, maybe 12 to 20 people, uh, coaching each other and working with me uh, both one-on-one -on -one and in small groups okay and so that will start May 1st you can find out all about it on the website um, and I'll maybe give you my email as well I would love to hear from anybody who's really interested in working more deeply on this yeah and I've got I've got like a little kind of mischievous part of me that wants to suggest that you know if you ever wanted to put something together for grown-up sensitives you might have um, you might have a willing audience um, so I'll just throw that in there. I think that's got, I get excited about that. I think that's, that's, I think that's a really good idea. I think you should just do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you know, that is part of my reason for wanting to get a little bit outside the direct therapy service way. Yeah. Because I've worked with families where they're caring for both a young child and an elderly grandparent. Yeah. And some of the same strat sensory survival strategies, they apply to all of us, yeah. the caregiver the elderly grandparent and the young child, yeah. but, but without it being a kind of a community, let's work together on this kind of delivery, mm. then it's really hard to work across the spectrum like that. Yeah. Yeah. Really so I'm important. focusing on kids right now because that's the world I know best. Yeah. But in inside, I know that we're all in this together. Yeah. 
Super. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure the listeners got lots and I will be listening to that again because I think people will need to listen to that a couple of times because that's rich with information. So thank you so much. Kara, thank you so much for having me. Okay. And I'll speak to you later. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.